Good afternoon. Uh, this is kind of a new experience for me. I kind of feel like the weather girl on Channel 3 pointing to the stuff, but hopefully this will work. Uh, we're going to talk about EDM wire selection. This is actually a shot of a skim cut being taken on my lab machine. And uh, a little bit about myself. I'm editor and publisher of EDM Today magazine. This is my 58th year in the EDM business. Started in 1965, so I'm considered a fossil. Uh, and uh, I also run an EDM consulting company. Okay, the key thing that we deal with in EDM and wire EDM in particular is that in most machining processes, we program the feed rate. If you were running a mill or a, a, a drill or a lathe, you would program the feed rate. And if you were too aggressive, you'd break the cutter. And if you weren't aggressive enough, you'd be wasting time. But in EDM, we don't have that same thing. We don't program feed rates. The feed rate is determined by the cutting condition, by the servo. It's not going to go any faster than it can go. So it's not programmed by the operator. And therefore, the cutting conditions, one of the primary things in the cutting conditions is the efficiency of the EDM wire that we're using. And so that's going to be our topic for today. So back in 1975, when I bought my first wire EDM, we used copper. Because copper being one of the better conductors of electricity, this is an electrical process. So it logically seemed that uh, copper would be the thing to do. And that's what we use. Except copper has some issues. Number one, it's got lousy mechanical strength and uh, breaks and can't be auto-threaded. And so very quickly, we got away from copper and went to brass, probably 1978. And uh, brass did a lot of good things for us. Uh, power supplies were redesigned, and it cut faster. It had higher tensile strength, so it now could be auto-threaded, and it cut faster. And even today, brass is probably 65% of the wire used in wire EDM today. It's great, great material. Now, when you deal with brass wire, there are three different compositions. Brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. So it's uh, either 65, 35, which is the, Japan, the oriental alloy, 63, 37, which is the European alloy, and 60, 40, which is the high performance alloy. The key number is the zinc number. The zinc number is what makes it cut faster. So we love zinc. Now, the difference between 65, 35, and 60, 40 is only maybe 2 to 3%. And that's if you optimize your conditions. So in most applications, you're, not, you're really not going to see it unless you're in a production environment where every last percent means a lot. Now, some people would say, well, zinc the good thing. Why are we limited to 40? Because you can't make wire with more than 40% zinc. It's too brittle, and it can't be drawn. Now, the other thing we have to deal with is what's the temper of the wire. Not only what is the core of the wire, what is the temper? So we have hard wire, which is between 800 and now 1,100 newtons per millimeter squared. Wires are metric. Wire, demand, wire properties are measured in metric units. Half hard, which is half as, literally half as hard as the hard wire, and then soft. So the first question is, why do we have those three tempers? Because when we're tapering, the wire, as you can see, has to go around a corner coming out of the upper guide and into the lower guide. And a hard wire doesn't like to do that. It resists that. And therefore, a softer wire will easily conform. And so we're into the situation of tapering. So the only reason we use a, soft, a softer wire, either half hard or soft, is tapering. In theory, a softer wire can cut slightly faster. We've tested it but it's only like a percent or two because it has a more give to it. So if you temporarily overload the wire in a cut, it's less likely to snap because it's got a little give. But again, it's more noise in most operations. You're not going to see it. So you want to go with hard wire. And soft wire won't auto-thread in many machines, and neither will half hard wire. So here's another depiction of wire in a tapering application. Now, we show two lines. We have a dotted line and a solid line. The dotted line is the mathematical, theoretical path of the wire from the upper guide to the lower guide. That's the path the machine knows about. 
But the actual path, due to the wire not wanting to conform to the, to the, to the exit and entrance of the guides, forms something a little different. And if you look carefully, that is in the shape of an S. And that's why this is called S-ing. So that the taper you think you're getting isn't exactly the taper you're getting unless you do tests. And therefore, tapering is never as seldom is as accurate as straight cuts. Now, what wire do we use when? Typically, hard wires up to five degrees, half hard wires up to 15 degrees, and soft wires, anything beyond that. Now, also, I want to caution you that you have to have most machines for high taper angles, you have special guides. They're high taper guides. And of course, the other thing you run into is the hole in your flush cup. Depending on how much your wire is leaning, your wire can lean into the flush cup. And all of a sudden, the shape you got isn't at all what you programmed because you were influencing the wire with your flush cup. The bigger the taper, the bigger the hole in the flush cup has to be. So I thought it would be instructive to show you folks how wire is made. So wire is made by the continuous casting process shown here, and then it is deformed mechanically, and then it is drawn. So continuous casting, we, if we've got 60-40, we take 60 pounds of, of copper, 40 pounds of zinc, melt it, dump it into one hopper. The bottom of the hopper, there are openings, which are graph lined with graphite, water-cooled, and you let it run out, and it forms a, a rod. And it's called continuous casting, because as long as you keep the hopper full of molten material, you can go on making wire forever without interruption. In the old, old days, we took a bloom of brass that was cast, that was maybe three feet by three feet by six feet, and rolled it and rolled it and rolled it and rolled it and, rolled it and then drew it. That's not done anymore. So there it is. There's your continuously cast rod. This is from Bedra in Germany. This is 16 millimeters in diameter. But a cast structure is not what we necessarily want for uh, our wire EDM process. You can see, if you look at the far left, that is a cast piece of brass. And it has a radial grain structure. And just like in wood, grain matters. We don't want that. So the first thing we do is we deform that and change the structure, as you see in the lower left, from something more like what we want that the, direct, the structure is in the order, not axial, it is linear. And that's generally, this is about a, a six millimeter square. And that's done by rolling in some cases. Each manufacturer has a different idea. Now, brass is like any metal, you can only squish it so many times and it gets so brittle you can't work it anymore. Your paper clip, you clip back and forth three times and it breaks. So we have to anneal it to refine the, to reestablish the original large grain structure. And then we start drawing it. Now, there's a schematic of the drawing process. You have your undrawn into a tapered opening, which culminates in an opening of the size you want to get out of it. And so here we have undrawn going in, drawn going out. And because of a conservation of mass, the velocity of the wire going in is a lot smaller than the velocity of the wire going out. Now, you can only deform the wire so much with each drawing pass. Only about 15% of its diameter reduction is allowed or it will break. So this is a drawing machine. Now, the wire is coming into this machine at one millimeter. It goes through 10 dies, back and forth, back and forth. And now it's coming out at 0.25 millimeter. This is done spraying lubricant on the capstans and on the dies. You'll notice the capstans change in diameter because each time it goes through a draw die, it gets longer. So it goes in at one speed and comes out at a lot higher speed. Drawing is occurring at about well over 1,000 feet a minute. After it comes out, it's too hard to be used. It is so brittle it would break almost if you blew on it. So we run the wire. The wire comes in here, goes over this pulley which is uh, conductive, goes through this chamber, which is open right now, but it will close and be filled with water, and goes over another conductive pulley, and we induce a current through the wire, heating it up to soften it. Now, we do it under water to prevent oxidation, because if the wire was hot, it would oxidize. Now, we can adjust the temper of the wire by how much current we pass through it. The more current, the softer the wire. Then most machines now go right into an auto, it comes out of the annealing chamber through this door into an automatic spooler, which changes the spools, does it entirely automatic. 
But that then creates a problem because we remember the wire was going 1,000 feet a minute when we were drawing, but when we change the spool, it's got to be going zero feet a minute. So we have a ramp up and a ramp down. Empty spool, stopped, ramped up, drawing, ramp down, full spool removed. Now the properties of the wire passing through those guides can be slightly different during those periods of shutdown. And so for folks who are extremely demanding, that can be an issue because the wire straightness might be a little different, whatever. So what the manufacturer does is he discards the outer layer of the spool. He puts more than the weight on there and he takes off between three and 400 meters of wire. So that solves the problem at the, at the outer edge of the spool, but we can't solve the problem at the inner side of the spool. And the way we solve that, if you have a real critical application like 5% of all the applications, you don't use the spool to the very end. Cheap tool makers like me use it to the very end. But if you have an extremely critical process, you need to be aware that the properties of the wire are slightly different at the very end of the spool. That's not just because we sell wire, it's just a fact. So, coated wire. So the standard is brass. 65% of the people that use wire still use brass. It's great, great material, great universal material. But if you want to cut faster, you're going to have to change your wire. Just like if you're machining with, uh, in a lathe or with end mills, you, we put a coating. The coating improves the efficiency of the process, as it does with wire. So when we have a coated wire, the question is, what are we going to coat? We can coat regular brass. We can coat pure copper, which has much higher conductivity. Or we can use a high copper brass. So why do we do whatever? The distance between your power feed contact and the top of the work is generally about two inches. Modern wire EDMs are passing as much as 300 amps through that 10 thousandths wire. Now picture a lamp cord, which is 16 gauge, is only good for 15 amps. We're passing 300 amps through a, one small conductor. There's a loss involved there. That energy doesn't all get to the cut. So copper is one of the most conductive materials, so that would be the ideal core for the wire. The problem is copper, back in the, like in the early days, it's soft. And so you can't auto-thread it. In the early days, only Charmise could auto-thread half-hard wires. So then we use brass as a coating, but brass has only 20% of the conductivity of copper. So we came up with a high copper brass, 80% copper, 20% zinc, which is hard enough to be auto-threaded, yet has more conductivity than regular brass. So let's talk about coating types. Again, zinc is the key thing. Zinc is our, our, is our friend. Zinc cuts better makes things cut faster. But zinc is a horrible material to make a wire out of because it has almost no tensile strength and it has an extremely low melting point. So we can't have a zinc wire. So what's the next best thing? Let's put zinc on the surface of something else. Now, why does zinc, there's some debate about this, but the, according to the metallurgists, and I'm not one, but I know some, is zinc is good because it sublimes. So when the spark hits it, it doesn't make it doesn't make dirt, it doesn't make a deposit, it goes right to a gas. And if it goes to a gas, you don't have to flush it away. And in EDM, flushing, flushing, flushing are the three most important things. And theoretically, that's why it cuts faster. It's called flushability. And you have the same thing with dry ice, which is shown here. Now, brass, as I said, is a combination of zinc and copper. So our normal brasses in our solid brass wire is called alpha brass. And that has a face-centered cubic structure. Now, why do we care about the structure? Because carbon is lamp black. Carbon is also diamond. The only difference is the structure. Entirely different properties, same stuff. So here we have a shiny gold color alloy, which is our standard brass. Then we have a thing called beta brass. When we increase the zinc percentage, it changes phase to a body-centered cubic, which means it has different properties, different melting point, different stiffness, et cetera. And that's between 41 and 48, and it's a different color. 
If we increase the zinc content further, between 49 and 70, the wire turns silver, and it's a complex structure, and it becomes very brittle, but it's a good cutting thing. And we'll talk about what all that ramifications are later. So we don't want pure, the original coated wires were zinc, which we'll talk about in a second. But the problem with pure zinc is it has a low melting point. So we often want to have a high zinc brass on that coating. And how do we do that? We plate the core with zinc, we heat treat it. In heat treatment, we have a process called diffusion where molecules from the high concentration intermix with the molecules of the low uh, concentration. So the, the zinc transforms into one of these alloys of brass depending on how we have the heat treating done, which raises its melting point. And we do that in a furnace. That's how we put the zinc on the wire. We plate it. But we plate it at one millimeter. We don't plate it at finished size because it's not economical to pass that much wire through a plating bath. This is about 100 feet long. Wire goes back and forth. And so whatever core you have, you electroplate a, a layer of zinc on it, pure zinc. And then we do the diffusion process to create a brass layer. But let's look at wire types. So the original coated wire, 1978, was zinc coated. Five micron, only two tenths coating. But that coating is put on at finished size, at uh, one millimeter, and then it's drawn down. So it's more coating at, at one millimeter. By the time you draw it down, it's only five microns. Pure zinc. The problem with pure zinc is it has a low melting point. It doesn't last very long, especially on thicker parts. So halfway through the part, you're cutting with brass. So it did cut faster, but it didn't cut as fast as we thought it should. The next wire was called X-Type. It was developed by Charmy and Thermal Compact. It was called uh, X-Wire, uh, and uh, it was called stratified wire is what they called it. We call it X-Wire because it was, uh, the next guy that made it was Birkenhoff. It was called Bronco Cut X. So you have a copper core, greater conductivity. You have a beta layer, which is thicker, 8 tenths rather than 2 tenths. And this is a great wire. It's still used today. The problem is back to copper. Can't use it in a lot of machines. So the guys that needed to auto thread it, like Agi at the time, Agi and Charmy were arch enemies in the, in the Switzerland, said, we got to come up with something better. So they used the 80-20 core, which is hard enough so that when I see with a soft core, when you go around a pulley, it takes the shape of the pulley. Even though the wire was straight when it came off the spool, you go through the pulley, it's curved, and then it goes out of the stream. So by going to 80-20, doing the same coating process, they developed a D-type wire, which was developed and named for the Agi 100D power supply back in the 80s. So this is a wire that can be used on any machine. Today, the most commonly used coated wire is called gamma brass. It's got a coating of gamma phase on the surface, meaning that he treated the zinc to become gamma, which has got a pretty high zinc content. But it's only two tenths thick because the, zinc, the gamma phase is so brittle, it would break up and peel right off if you tried to make the coating thicker. Now, you'll notice that there are, the metallurgists call these discontinuities, I call them cracks. And you would think that's bad, but it's good for two reasons. One, it allows water to get in there and acts like a radiator and keeps the coating cool. And two, it scours some of the junk out of the gap when you are machining. So what this actually looks like is this. It's not a nice coating at all. It's a bunch of broken up pieces of gamma brass that are embedded into the core. So in some places you got a lot and in some places you don't have any. But on average, it's about five microns. And this is the most commonly used coated wire today. It's relatively economical. Those other wires we talked about with the thicker coatings takes longer to make them. They're going to be more expensive. So this is the most commonly used wire today, which, uh, again, is called gamma brass. Well, somebody got the bright idea. If we took our, if, if that gamma phase is so great, why don't we put it on top of the beta phase and make a double coated wire and it'll cut faster and it does. So this is called gamma X because it's an X wire with a gamma layer on it. So you have an eight tenths layer here and a two tenths layer there and it works very well. 
it is one of the faster wires out there. But again, it's copper core, so not everybody's machine can auto-thread copper. So sure enough, we make a D version called Gamma D. Now it can be used in anybody's machine. This is also called heat wire for the Makinos. It is a double, it's an 80-20 core with a beta layer, 8 tenths, and a 2 tenths gamma layer. And there it is. So there's your broken up pieces of gamma, and you can see here, this is your beta. In my opinion, one of the best wires out there. Now, because they have a double layer, they're going to cost more. Because to make it, you take the core wire, you plate it, you heat treat it, then you plate it again, then you heat treat it again. So it's going to cost more, but it's going to give you better performance. Now, this is a gamma brass wire that's, I've got the same slide, I don't have an actual picture. But they make it slightly different. They coat it at six tenths of a millimeter rather than at one millimeter. And because they don't draw it down so much, the coating doesn't break up nearly as much. And you end up with a smoother surface for high precision cuts. So people that are really fussy about coated wires uh, and want to use this type of wire, and also a lot of people that do carbide will use this wire for high precision, good surface finish. So now, if you're cutting real thick stuff, really thick stuff, now, there are people that cut parts 48 inches thick in a wire EDM. And so you have to think about how long that coating is going to last. And so we developed a wire with a double thick beta layer on it called Optima X. And it's got a 30 micron coating rather than an 18 micron coating. And you use it for thick stuff, generally over 6 inches, 6 to 12. But again, it's copper core. This is the fastest wire on the planet, not including the 16 thousandths wire we use on the heat extreme machines, but that's not available in 10. High conductivity, thick coating. And of course, we have a D version too for the people that can't use uh, copper core. Not quite as fast because of the conductivity of the core. Again, used for thick stuff. Also, it turns out this particular wire, I have a lot of fair amount of experience with it. In lousy flushing conditions, this works quite well. Beta is not as, uh, gamma brass is very fussy about flushing, beta brass is not. And then there's another wire recently developed called Optima Z. This has a hybrid gamma beta coating put on in one step rather than two steps. So it's not as expensive as the double coated wires. The coating is thicker. It's 12 microns rather than 5 microns. So for those parts between 2 and 6 inches, this, this, can, this can work. And it's less expensive. So that, there's the gamma, and there's the beta, and the beta underneath it. All done in one process. But of course, our EDM wires, uh, when we're dealing with brass, brass starts to become an issue at 4 thousandths or less because it's just with a small cross section, it's just not strong enough, and it, you have a lot of breakage problems. There are people that use brass in four. Very few people use brass in three. I tried it once, didn't work at all. So in the old days, we went to Molly, because Molly's a lot stronger and has a much higher melting point. And so usually between two and four, we use Molly. And Molly is uh, a good wire for that. But there's a lot of disadvantages to Molly. It cuts slower. It's much more expensive. Has a shelf life. It doesn't auto thread real well. And nowadays, the other problem is Molly was used to help make incandescent lamps. We don't make incandescent lamps any. So it was kind of a byproduct. They didn't make it just for EDM. They made it for the lamp industry. Well, you cannot buy Molly made in the United States anymore because there's no more lamp industry. And, and coming from overseas, the quality has been horrible. So bad that SST, when they sell it to us, you take it as it comes. If it's curly, too bad. You can't send it back. You can't get credit for it. So that's a problem. The other thing is Molly is so hard that after it goes through the gap, it gets the EDM finish on it. It eats your carbide contacts on the exit side, and it eats your wire guides. So that's the other reason. But we had to live with it, where there's a solution for that now. 2000s and below, we went to tungsten. Now, this is a, a spool of oxidized tungsten wire because tungsten does have a shelf life. I know at uh, 
Fanuc, they only they claim that tungsten only has a six month shelf life. And so you don't want your wire looking like that. It doesn't cut that good. But tungsten is stronger and has a higher melting point than moly, and therefore it is used from two thousandths all the way down to six tenths. I've worked with one thousandths wire. I wouldn't want to work with six tenths wire, but it is made and it is available. It has all the disadvantages of moly. High cost, slow cutting speed, uh, poor quality, sh short shelf life. Plus the fact, again, it, it also eats the, the lower guides. Now, when you're using small wires to get around that, you just take out the lower carbide. Because you don't need that much contact. There's very little current going through the wire. So the standard trick is remove the lower power feed. Steel core wires. Nothing is stronger than steel. If you have a wire breakage e issue, and no matter what you've tried, break, 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 no matter what you've done, you've gone to 12, you've slowed the wire down, you've done, cut the power back, still breaks. Say you have gaps in your parts, a casting with porosity, whatever. We go to steel core wire. Of course, steel is a horrible conductor of electricity. And so what we do is we coat it with copper. That's the layer that conducts the juice. Then we coat it with beta, which is the layer that cuts. And, uh, we have a wire, and that's what the people that cut 48 inches thick use. But it's a wire, it's the wire of last resort. You can't scrap chop it. You can't auto thread it. So it's the wire of last resort. But when you run into a problem and you can't cut it, and you have to cut it, it's nice to be able to call on this wire. It's only available in 8, 10, and 12. I had to cut apart a large 48 inch diameter ring, and I had to cross section it. They didn't have this at that time. It took me forever to get through it, and what I found was the casting was hollow on the inside. So I was going through material, through a hollow spot, and then back through material, but my flushing was only out here. Also, to complicate matter, the, uh, the hollow was filled with sand. So I would have loved to have had this at the time. So we also have a micro wire. Our brand, I believe, is called Sumi Spark. This is a steel core wire with a gamma layer on it, and the gamma layer, somehow, they figured out to put it on at finish size with a perfectly smooth finish. This wire is available down to 8 tenths, from 4 thousandths down to 8 tenths, and it's my go-to wire. There are other steel core wires, one with a brass coating, just regular brass, one with a zinc coating, regular zinc, but none with a gamma coating. So this wire cuts faster than those other wires. It's cheaper than Molly and tungsten. It's auto-threadable, it cuts faster than moly and tungsten, and most of our customers that use moly and tungsten are converting to this wire as we speak. Of course, we deal with spool sizes because European machines are designed for DIN spools, which is a German standard. Oriental machines are designed for P spools. P's are available in P3, 6.6, P5, 11 or 13.2, P10, 22, P15, 44. On the DIN spools, you can get 3.3, 7.7, 17.5, 50, and 100 pound spools. Believe me, you don't want to deal with a 100 pound spool. You don't even want to deal with a 50 pound spool, as many of our customers have found out. And for the bigger spools, you need unwinders. They're not going to fit on your machine anyway. All right, so we have this whole plethora of wires. What do we use, which is really why you're here. But I wanted to give you the background. So this is what you got to consider when you're thinking about what wire to use. And when customers call me, this is what I deal with. Workpiece material, workpiece thickness, flushing conditions, geometry, taper, threading, contour tolerance, surface finish requirements, surface integrity, surface contamination. Machine tool, brand and model, and production versus work. Without this information, it's a, it's a poke, poke in the dark. So when we're going to choose a wire, we got to figure out what kind of core. If we're going to have a coated wire, what's the core going to be? What's the coating going to be? Single or multiple layer? What alloy is going to be in the coating? How thick is the coating? And what's the coating morphology? Morphology is a fancy word for the roughness of the surface. So those uh, gamma phase wires with the cracks in it would be one morphology and a nice smooth surface would be something else. All that being said, we can summarize this in this little cheat sheet that I have. 
And again, it's, it's, it's a generalization. Without answering all those questions, I can't be specific. Uh, and if you check with your SST or Makino representative, they can get you a copy of this cheat sheet. So general purpose, again, brass is a wonderful wire. Use it for lots and lots of stuff. But then I would go to the gamma-coated brass core wire. And the highest possible speed is the double-coated wires or the double-thickness wire. Carbide, either pure. Some folks still prefer, some of the carbide folks prefer pure zinc coatings rather than gamma coatings. We have both. And both, each one, it's, uh, you know, everybody likes their own stuff. Copper tungsten, beta coating. Aerospace alloys, again, double-coated wires, typically. Generally, steel. To, uh, greater than two inches thick, gamma over beta coating, between two and six, hybrid coating, greater than six, double thickness coating, anything greater than 12, macro steel, poor flushing. Again, I said that uh, we t I did an experiment with a customer that was using X wire in, in Canal, and I said, let's try the gamma X and see how it works. So we had a flat piece of ink canal. We did a test cut with X, test cut with gamma X, 10% faster, fine. But his parts are aerospace, and he doesn't have sealed flushing. So we tried it in his actual parts, didn't do a damn thing. Gamma likes good flushing. Beta is not so sensitive to flushing. So wire diameter is less than, uh, so poor flushing, the beta-coated wires are good. Uh, the steel core, in a, when it does not, nothing else works, Less than four thousandths, the micro steel, the sumi spark. And the last one is an important one, prohibition on zinc contamination. Zinc is our go-to alloy for this business. And uh, in the aerospace industry, they, they coat some of the wire cut parts with ceramic because in the engines it's so hot. Ceramic coatings don't stick where there's zinc contamination. So all of our wires are out the window except Molly. Now, in the medical field, if you, any of you have a boat, what do you put on the bottom so that it doesn't grow stuff? You put copper, copper-based stuff. Copper is toxic to living organisms, including you. And so certain things that are implanted in the body that are wire EDM'd can't be cut with a copper-based wire. Well, brass has got copper in it. So all of our wires have copper in it. So we're back to Molly again. Molly seems to be inert, and Molly doesn't bother the coating process in aerospace. Man, I'd hate to be cutting production with Molly. You see, when you cut anything with a wire or anything with an EDM, the surface of, what, of your workpiece gets contaminated, if you want to call it that, with some brass, some copper, and actually oxygen from the water gets into there. And so surface can, the three properties of a surface are surface finish, surface integrity, which is the cracks, uh, heat affected zone and surface contamination and some people don't want any of that stuff on there But it would be up to the customer to specify that Coated wire costs more. So really that's what we're here for. We're here to make money. So let's look at the Cost analysis quickly. What does brass wire cost? This is a little out of date because inflation has taken its mighty toll, but the relative expenses are so we assume 10 brass, 8 meters a minute, P5, 11 pound spool, average wire cost, let's say four bucks an hour to run your wire EDM, say a part running a two inch thick workpiece. But what does a machine cost? Well, you've got the wire, filters, guides, carbide, resin, belts, depreciation, financing, taxes, space costs, maintenance, Utilities, direct labor, overhead. It's not unusual or unreasonable to think a wire machine might cost 50 bucks an hour. Well, therefore, our wire is only a relatively small percentage of the cost of running that machine. Now, each shop is different. So these figures are going to be off 25% maybe. But even the order of magnitude shown here, the wire is a small component of running the machine. So now, we learn a couple of things if we use this analysis. What is the wire cost impact on the total cost? 
So the commonly held view, especially by purchasing agents who know only that $2 is more than $1, is that the wire, if the wire doesn't cut 10% fast, the wire should cut 10% fast, more than 10% faster if it's going to cost more than 10% more. And that, my friends, is bogus. Because let's look at some numbers. Let's look at our gamma brass, which is the most popular brass wire. Costs maybe 23% more than regular brass. Increases speed by 15%. So our total cost went up by less than 2%, and we got a 15% upward gain. Most accountants would like that. Go further. Let's look at our gamma D wire, 46% more expensive. Cutting performance, 25%. Cost increase, 4%, 25% gain. So the key equation to remember is that the total operations cost increase by going to coded wire is going to be the cost increase times the percentage of the total cost. And again, those figures change, but you can see the order of magnitude is such that no matter how you calculate it, it makes sense most of the time. We'll talk about that in a second. But what else can you get out of this? Faster performance results in increased capacity. Uh, customer or client, uh, GE Toshiba in Monterey, Mexico, has 64 FANUX running 24-7, cutting 2-inch thick, 316 stainless, roughing out turbine, steam turbine blades. They needed to increase their capacity. Going to buy 16 more machines. So I suggested that they do coated wire. You wouldn't have to buy any. Unfortunately, they didn't listen to me. They bought 16 more machines. But you can increase your capacity just by becoming more efficient using coated wires. And also, the faster performance helps you meet deadlines. During the day, you know, a lot of wire shops do small jobs and then do the bigger ones at night. Well, you can get more small jobs in and get that machine ready for the night burn by cutting faster. So how do we get that coated wire performance? Unfortunately, a lot of machines don't have all these different settings for gamma X and gamma D and gamma brass and this. Some machines only have brass settings. So we have a number of ways we can deal with that. So if we only have brass tech on our machine and you throw a coated wire on, it will cut faster. Don't do a thing. Take your old wire off, put the new wire on in the same burn, it'll cut faster. But it can cut significantly faster yet if you play with the settings a little bit. And we're going to talk about how we can do that. So in a modern wire EDM, this is particularly in Makino, seeing that we're here at Makino, we have what's called an easy off add slider bar, which rather than getting all into on time and off time and peak current and servo voltage, all we have to do is move that one notch and the machine cuts 5% more aggressively, but it doesn't change the surface finish or the overcut. It changes the off time and servo voltage and some other settings. And so it's a very simple matter to optimize our coated wire. We move it up 5%, run it for a while, move it up another five, move it up, and at a certain point it's gonna break. Back it down one notch and you now optimize for your coated wire using a brass technology. And this is not unique to Makino. They have it on Sodex, they have it on Mitsubishi's. I'm not sure if they have it on Fanix. So that's the simple way to do it. But not everybody has this. So if you don't have that machine with the coded technology, now Charmese have X technology and they have brass technology, but here's what you play with. You reduce off time a little bit. You push the servo voltage down to make it follow tighter, tighter gap. Those two things alone are the main things you play with. Now in many machines, you have parameters for wire and corner protection settings, and you can make it more aggressive by playing with those. It depends on the machine. Uh, I think Fanix have WEP A and WEP B. Uh, Charmi has some uh, different settings. But so you make a little change, see what happens. Now you've got to let the machine respond. The servo system lags. You, you change the off time one notch. You can't start changing something else. You gotta let the machine, it'll go faster and then it'll slow down, it'll go faster, and it'll finally, and then you do it with the servo. And again, you do it until it breaks. And you back up a little bit and you got it. 
always, anytime you make a parameter change, it's going to make the cut slightly less stable because the machine tool manufacturer wants bulletproof settings. They don't want you coming back complaining that their machine is breaking the wire all the time. So they're conservative settings, but they're conservative for a reason because your wire is not going to break. So you may have occasional wire breaks with the more aggressive settings. Years ago, coated wire had a nasty reputation because that's what it did. The coating would come off. Those little particles would come out of the, the core and land in your upper guy. And maintenance became an issue, the maintenance people. But that problem has largely been solved. There are now coated wires that, and I, I test them, I audit wires from Aquino that are actually cleaner than brass wires. So it's not a big issue. But it's not always the answer. Again, why would 65% of the people be using brass? They're not all ignorant. So when, when time is not important, if you have a machine you're only using every other day, why the hell would you want to cut faster? Because the operator's not going to stand in front watching it. Or night or weekend burns. Let's say you have a night burn that with your brass wire finishes at 5 a.m. So we switch to coated wire and it finishes at 2 a.m. and sits there for an extra three hours. Why would we waste the money to do that? When, so when capacity is not an issue and thin parts, coated wires really don't do much. For, if you're cutting sheet metal, you don't, any wire will do. Brass is just fine. And when flushing is not with sealed nozzles, like I said, the gamma wires tend to like sealed flushing. Nozzles between five and 15 thousandths away from the part and sometimes you can't, again, EDM is related flushing, flushing, and flushing. If you can't get the shit out of there, oh, they're gonna, there's going to be a bleep in this presentation. I can see it now. Uh, you can't move forward. You've got to get rid of the stuff. And, and coated wires, gamma coated wires are especially sensitive to that. So that, uh, as I said in that, uh, what I, uh, this customer that tried the, uh, on the Inconel, because he had lousy flushing, the gamma coating didn't help on the X wire at all. So it all depends. Go back to that list of those nine or 11 items, this, that, the other thing. Those are the questions I'm gonna ask when you folks call me and ask for a specific recommendation. These are the wires that SST sells. We sell brass wires, zinc coated wires, X wires, deep wires, and specialty wires. We sell more variety of wire than anybody in the country. So if it exists, we have it. So we have five brass wires. We have seven X wires. And again, this thing skipped by. We have seven zinc coated wires. We have specialty wires. So we can satisfy here. Now here's a little advertisement that we slip in for EDM today. I'm the editor of the magazine. It's the only magazine in the world dedicated to EDM. It's quarterly, it's free, and you can sign up in the back. And we'd be delighted. And you can also go to our website. And all the back issues to 2010 are on there. Articles, search engine. There's a treasure trove of EDM knowledge on our website. And that's some of the stuff that's available on there. And this is my consulting company. And saying that, my consulting company, I work for Makino as a consultant. That means I can work for you. So uh, through your sales guy, you can, I can help you on the phone. If it's a significant problem and you use a lot of wire, I can go visit your plant. I do all of this stuff for Makino. And again, that's something nobody else does in the industry. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate your audience. Have a great day. Roger, thank you very much. And thank you to the audience as well. Again, I want to point to the chat and Q&A functionality. Um, <clears throat> so please don't hesitate to post your questions through this tool. And one, uh, one that came in, uh, Roger, was um, asking you know, if you could repeat the angles for hard, uh, we are transitioning from like a hard wire to a soft wire in, uh, in paper cuts. 
Typically, folks use a uh, hard wire up to about 5 degrees. Between 5 and 15, we use half hard, and usually anything over 15, we use soft. Uh, again, that's pr operator preference, application related, but that's a pretty good rule of thumb. And again, the key thing is that if you're going to go over 15, you better consider uh, tapering guides and that you have a big enough hole in the flush cup so that you don't deflect the wire when it leans into the, the flushing hole. Could those numbers be different from machine manufacturer to machine manufacturer? They, again, application, part of the application is the machine. And yes, so again, uh, I always tell people that, yes, I'm the applications guy. I've been in the business 50 58 years, I've been doing all this stuff, but use the applications people of your machine manufacturer. They know more about your machine than certainly I do and than anybody else does. So I have oftentimes people come to me and say, what should I do? What should I do? And the first thing I said, if you have talked to the machine manufacturer first, and they say no. So I would strongly advise that you uh, use that resources. They want you to be successful. And they'll do many things to make you successful. So you buy that next machine from them. They don't want to have you out there struggling. And suddenly now you're bad mouthing the machine because it's the machine's fault. And usually it's not the wire's fault and it's not the machine's fault. And we can get to the bottom of it. But uh, and again, I'm here to help. But so is the application department from your machine manufacturer. Thank you, Roger. Um, another question that we saw was um, when you talked about sink contamination or the desire to minimize it or exclude it, and that molly wire is typically a product of choice there, um, with the difficulties of that molly um, that are inherent to a money wire. Are there are there alternatives around it or recommended recommended ways around it? Well, uh, again, we talked in some detail about all the disadvantages of Molly: price, speed, quality, straightness, uh, eating the guides, uh, and unfortunately, at this moment, there are not. Uh, there is a wire that's being promoted that has a, uh, a nickel coating rather than a zinc coating. And uh, that could be helpful. But uh, again, you got to be careful. In a rough cut, you often end up, uh, it still has a brass core. And in a rough cut, you end up oftentimes going by the bottom of the part, you end up going through the coating. So you could stand a, for a single pass cut. That may not be the answer either. Uh, I think it was more intended that you use the same wire and then do skim cuts and then you skim off any of the uh, contamination. I've done quite a few studies. If you check EDM today, uh, I work with the University of Connecticut. We do electron micro, uh, electron, uh, electro, electron microscope uh, uh, chemical analysis called EDX. And we have analyzed many specimens. By the way, this contamination occurs in sinkers too. In sinkers, you also get carbon contamination. So you get a, you get a portion of the electrode, a portion of the dielectric that bonds into the surface, alloys into the surface. And some people have thought that, well, okay, well, I'll do skimp cuts and I'll get rid of it. Well, skimp cuts reduce the layer of the uh, heat affected zone dramatically so that sometimes it's less than a micron left. And they do reduce the contamination, but the contamination on the surface even, and we have studies that show this, the contamination on the surface after four skims is still there. So that uh, not a lot of options at this point in time, quite frankly. And in, again, that's a very small percentage of the applications, 1% if that. So it's not something to get excited about unless your customer specifies that. And then we can we have some sophisticated tests where we can test samples and test wires and and do all of this chemical uh, electron microscope analysis, which of course is relatively expensive. You're talking about 
uh, microscopes that are in the, uh, between one million and four million dollars. So that the hourly rates on these things uh, are pretty high. But if the, the the conditions warrant, we can do it. And could you also comment a little bit more on um, why Molly is? creating issues specifically in the aerospace industry or maybe in certain parts that are done for the aerospace in industry? Well, the only issue with Molly there is the cost and the speed. But the, the, the surfaces are, there are no issues that I am aware of. Molly seems to not, the alloying of the Molly on the surface does not seem to interfere with the coating process and the medical people don't seem to be too concerned about it either. It, it evidently is within the body. It's not an issue. And again, the coating is not an issue. It's just mm -hmm. cost and speed. Very good. And then one more question here is what is the best way to recycle spent wire? And can it be sold, reworked into smaller diameter wire, for instance? So the only way I am aware of for recycling uh, there's some, a couple issues with recycling. Uh, if you're using a copper core wire, uh, you can't sell it as copper because it's got a zinc coating on it. And even though the coating is relatively minute, especially in the case of a gamma brass, the most recyclers will downgrade what they're going to pay you for it because it's contaminated. Uh, they'll pay you one price for brass, but if you have brass wire with a zinc coating on it, They'll look at it and say, well, that ain't brass. And they're not going to go through the chemical analysis and the cross section and all of that. So they'll downgrade what they pay you for it. Although if you melted gamma brass wire, I don't think you'd change the zinc con of the total alloy by less than a percent. But uh, basically, it's because the wire is eroded, the wire is discontinuous. Uh, it's basically going to be melted down and Re, reuse somehow. It doesn't uh, uh, with inflation. It's you know depending on the price of copper, uh, the value of the scrap wire changes dramatically. I mean, uh, when we during the highest inflationary period, and then during the slowest period, uh, it changed by factor of two or three. I think right now wire scrap is a dollar a pound, something like that. Okay. Thank you, Roger. Oh, one other thing is a, a, an issue that people haven't asked about, but used to be a big deal. Everybody's interested in recycling. What do we do with the spools? <laughs> Nobody wants them. Uh, to send a truck to pick up empty spools, they're certainly not going to send them back to Asia or Europe where the wire is made and so that uh, you can take them to a recycling center, but no one's going to pick them up. There was a company that used to pick them up and reuse them, but they're not interested anymore. So that is unfortunately the environmental impact of EDM, but they are recyclable, but it's up to you to take them to some place and put them in the right bin. That's an excellent point there, Roger. And then another question that we received was, if you have, what, what type of uh, wire would you recommend for, uh, for carbide? Well, again, the carbide, either uh, gamma, uh, a, a true zinc coated brass, which was the original coated wire, some carbide companies prefer it, or wh what we call the Optima brass, Optima A, which is a gamma brass that is made under circumstances to give a better surface finish. That wire will give, uh, in testing, uh, Thermal Compact has tested it, will give superior performance and as equal to or better surface finish on carbide. Those are the two wires that we normally, again, uh, there are people that use X wires and D wires on carbide, but, uh, but the, the most commonly used wires are the zinc coated and the Optima A. Excellent, thank you. Um, I believe that's all the questions we have. Um, so thank you everybody for attending and Roger, thank you for providing your time and expertise. I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to do something like this again in the future.
So thank you very much, everybody. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you for listening. All right. Have a good afternoon, everybody.